Welcome to YouTube XB1. Up for critical review is Mark Passio interviewing Jordan Maxwell on the occult and astrotheology. This is a rare interview and the audio on Jordan's side isn't the greatest. Please like and subscribe. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, my special guest for this evening is Jordan Maxwell. I'll read a brief bio and then we'll get right to it. Jordan Maxwell is a preeminent researcher and independent scholar in the field of occultism and religious philosophy. His work exploring the hidden foundations of Western religions and secret societies creates enthusiastic responses from audiences around the world. Jordan has conducted <coughs> dozens of intensive seminars, hosted his own radio talk shows, guested on more than 600 radio shows, and written, produced, and appeared in numerous television shows and documentaries devoted to understanding ancient religions and their pervasive influence on world affairs today. His work on the subject of secret societies, both ancient and modern, and their symbols has fascinated audiences around the world for decades. His extraordinary presentations include documents and photographs seldom seen elsewhere. Considering the rapid, rapidly moving events of today and the very real part that hidden religious agendas play in our modern war-torn world, Jordan feels that these controversial subjects are not only interesting to explore, but too important to ignore. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What on Earth is Happening, a gentleman who I personally consider to be a mentor in truth, Mr. Jordan Maxwell. Jordan, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Mark. Pleasure to be with you. Absolutely. My, my honor to have you here tonight. So um, I'll start off by uh, just asking you how long you've been involved in the work of exposing hidden knowledge to the public. How long have you considered yourself a de-occultist of <laughs> hidden information? And uh, what was really the, the, the thing that put you over the edge to decide to start doing work like this? Uh, actually, I, I was always, always, even as a child, I was always interested in the hidden world. <clears throat> I realized at an early age, I don't know why, I just gravitated to, toward the idea, probably something in my personality or in the stars, but I, I always knew, I just had a gut feeling even as a kid, that there's, there's a whole world of knowledge you're not aware of, you know, that, there's things going on in the world and in the universe that you're not being told and that adults around me did not know anything about. And so I, I just always had a hankering to, I want to know what's really going on. I mean, I, I want to know what's really behind the scenes. And so as a kid, I, I started, uh, as I said, gravitating toward looking not just at what you're seeing, but what you're not seeing. What's the rest of the story? And, of course, my mother always uh, you know, said that no, no matter what we would hear happening in the community, you know, she would always say, well, there's two sides to every story, and sometimes there's three sides. And so I always knew that just because you're reading something in the paper about somebody and what they what they're supposedly have done or didn't do, whatever, there's all kinds of other information that you're not privy to know about. And probably most of it is... is, uh, is propaganda and the rest of it is prejudiced and so you never know unless you are you are yourself involved then you will know. I remember an ABC newsman many years ago on radio made an interesting statement that stuck with me. He said if you want to know how corrupt and uh, uh, how corrupt and inaccurate the news that you hear on radio and television, if you want to know how bad it really is, just wait till they do a story on you. Wait till something that you are personally involved in uh, comes out in the newspapers and on radio. Well, you were the one that was there. And watch what they're saying about you. Watch what, they're, watch what the, the uh, media is saying about the situation, about the problem, about you. You will know yourself what the real truth is and you will now hear the way the media is presenting it. So I, I, I realized that a long time ago and I'm, the more I 
looked into what I was believing, what my family was involved in, uh, the more it became uh, obvious to me. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to What on Earth is Happening here on Republic Broadcasting Network. I'm your host, Mark Passio. My website, whatonearthishappening.com. Tonight, my very special guest is occult researcher, Mr. Jordan Maxwell. Jordan, I have another question for you. Since you've begun doing the work that you do many years ago, uh, have you yourself, do you see any actual, perceivable, recognizable difference in what you would consider the overall state of consciousness of humanity, or at least, I'll qualify that and say, at least an increase in the interest in occulted knowledge and information. What is your take on that? Well, I, I, are you hearing me now? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, I would say probably the opposite. I would say that there seems to be less interest in anything intelligent uh, today than it was when uh, you know back in the sixties, fifties, sixties, and seventies. It was probably a lot more uh, open and, and and open to hear and you know and modicum of interest. Where today there seems to be so much going on in the world that's that's uh, of you know useless stuff, baseball and football and sports and movies and all that to where people really aren't getting it. The bottom line is people just don't get it, what's really going on. And so uh, they become sucked into and a part of the systems to, to such an extent that I don't really see people uh, waking up very much. Yeah, there are going to be those people who are, but it's going to be a very small group, very, very small number in comparison, because there are none so blind as those who choose not to see. And so it doesn't mean that uh, humans are so stupid they can't see. No, uh, most people at this point in life are scared, and they don't want to see. They don't want to hear anything that might frighten them or might, uh, you know, they don't want to engage in any conversation which is not talked about in polite company. I used to wonder about that. Why is it we don't want to talk about bad things certain people have done, you know, even in my family? Well, even if your uncle was a, a criminal, we don't want to talk about that. At dinner, we don't bring that up. Why not? Well, because we don't talk about religion or politics or anything unpleasant in, in polite company. We don't want to talk about that. And so the criminals say, thank God, this way nobody is talking about me, and I can continue to do what I do because nobody wants to talk about it. So I, I, you know, I, I think that uh, we are less aware today than we've ever been. And, but those, who pe those people who are aware are very much aware and doing uh, what they can to enlighten themselves, and that's the people that I am directing my voice to. I'm not interested in saving the world. The world can't be saved, period. I mean, Jesus tried it. It didn't work. And uh, all the other great prophets and intelligent people tried to do something. Nikolai Tesla tried to light the world, and all he got for it was uh, thrown, into a, uh, you know, thrown into chaos in his life and died a pauper. So I know that you're not going to save the human race. It's impossible to do it. What is uh, possible is to help those individuals who are trying to do something to help themselves and to understand the world. And so that's who I'm directing my uh, comments to, those who want to know. You know, I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, people are waking up today. And my comment to that is, yes, that's what people do when they're in prison every morning and Alcatraz and and in the big prisons of the world, people wake up. And when they wake up, they're still in prison, but at least they've woken, uh, at least they've awoken. But they're still in prison. So just because people are waking up, it doesn't mean they know anything. And they have no power. Even the people who are awakening today, in fact, have little to no power to do anything about the world situation. Even though they're awakening, and there may be quite a few but there's still the billions of people around the world who couldn't care less. 
Yeah, and so when I when I hear people say that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, I always say, yes, it's a train coming. So I don't see that civilization and the human race is going to be ex uh, going to be able to extricate itself or get itself out of uh, the mess that we're in. I only see chaos coming. And, and would, would I have you, to tell you, I've been looking at it for 50 years. I know what I'm talking about. I, I tend to agree that we definitely don't have a mass awakening uh, happening. That It's happening in small, isolated pockets uh, and scattered right. to the four corners of the earth, most certainly. Um, I, I personally see some more people coming on to the desire for occulted knowledge and hidden information and starting to look into things and do research for themselves. But I, I do see that as being a, uh, a very small movement when you compare it with the you know, a multitude of uh, the mindless masses that are out there that haven't even begun researching any of this information. Um, That's right. Uh, you know, I, I, I think um, that if we apply our will to... Uh, talk about those hidden issues that we that you uh, just mentioned, like the the corruption that is going on, and many more people do that work. Then maybe we could start to reverse that trend. But I certainly don't see that as uh, something that is happening in mass in any way as well. So I tend yeah. to. I tend to largely agree with your, your view when it comes to that. Can you give us your take on, uh, you know, uh, I've been accused of this in, in the past and actually up to the current day, and I've heard p other people calling uh, you a New Ager and call myself a New Ager. I, I don't consider myself a uh, member of the New Age movement by any stretch of anybody's imagination, uh, most of all my own, and I certainly don't consider you a, a New Ager by any means whatsoever. Can you give me uh, your honest take of what uh, you know many people would call the quote new age movement or new age spirituality <laughs> that's a loaded question big time uh, that's, that's a very very heavy duty question because if you understand the, the bible if you understand which uh, Christians across the board do not and one thing uh, that most Christians have in common is they do not understand much of anything. And so if they don't understand ancient history, they don't understand the culture from which the Bible has come from, and the terms and the words, and haven't looked at the etymology of uh, the concepts and the ideas expressed in the Bible, uh, you're never going to figure out what's, been, what's going on, and you're going to call people names. when well, that's what uh, small minds revert to. If you don't understand what's going on, you're not educated enough to intellectually discuss something, then just call people names. And that, 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 that'll that take care of it. You don't have to talk about the subject at all. You don't have to listen to anybody who knows what they're talking about. Just call them a name. And call them a new ager. And that implies, implication, is that they are mentally disordered and demon worshippers and devil worshippers and all that. But who is it that's calling people New Agers? It's born-again Christians who have no conceptual idea of what New Age or Age or any of it means. They have no idea of what it means. And there are a few out there who are leading, as the Bible said, there will be blind leading the blind, and both shall fall into the pit. And so by their fruits you shall know them, is what Jesus said. And that is something you need to keep in mind. By their fruits, you shall know them. We'll talk about that later. Very important words to keep in mind. Ladies and gentlemen, my special guest this evening, Jordan Maxwell. You're listening to What on Earth is Happening. We'll be right back. Let's swim to the moon. Back everyone, you're listening to What on Earth is Happening. I'm your host, Mark Passio. Tonight, my special guest joining us is Jordan Maxwell, occult researcher. Jordan, uh, you were saying before the break, uh, you were talking about the concept of uh, you shall know them by their fruits, you shall know them mm -hmm. by their works. I think it's very, very uh, 
critically important advice for people to take to heart. And uh, I feel that the the fruits of what we would call the quote unquote new age spirituality movement is inaction. It is uh, more than uh, really alerting people of their current true predicament in our world uh, and how the world is going deeper into bondage and slavery. I think what they're doing is giving people a watered down feel good variant of so called spirituality that's really keeping them in sort of a trance of inaction. Uh, would you agree? And can you speak to that? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's something to what you're saying. Um, but w what I think is even more important is the fact that um, the whole idea of a new age comes directly out of the Bible. Now, unfortunately, most Christians have no idea what I'm talking about. Some Jews do. Um, but the whole idea of the Bible's stories and talks about the new age. And today, all over the world, and especially in America, look at the literature published by Christian denominations all over the country. I don't care what denomination. Look and read the literature, like I have for some 54 years. Read the literature, and you will see everywhere uh, the term the church age and our and our age today and the gospel age of the gospel age and today we're in the uh, we're in the church age and then uh, they always quote uh, in Matthew uh, when Jesus said go forth uh, go forth uh, baptize in the, in the name of the Father Son and Holy Spirit and I will be with you to the end of the world that's what it says in the in, in the last. Uh, chapter in the last verse of uh, the book of Matthew. Jesus said, I will be with you to the end of the world. That's a mistranslation. The word in Greek is aeon, A-E-O-N, which was mistranslated world. Go back and do some homework. Instead of calling people names, go back and read the Bible. And it says, Jesus said, I will be with you to the end of the aeon. A-E-O-N, which is translated correctly, age. So Jesus said, I will be with you to the end of the age. So Christians will then say, oh, well, that, that was the gospel age, and so now we're in the church age. Well, now you're talking about ages. You understand? You're using the word age. Well, from the gospel age, now we have the church age. Could we say that the gospel age is a bygone era, is a bygone age, and that the church age was a new age? And if that is the case, then were there ages before the gospel age? Maybe there was uh, uh, other ages before that. Well, as you once you get into the Jewish literature and begin to read the rabbinical literature, you begin to see that the entire story of the Bible, both Old and New, but especially the New Testament, is an, uh, is an, uh, an astrological story. And it's talking about the New Age. That's what Jesus said. I will be with you to the end of the age. And so, what, what, uh, what are you talking about? It's a very big story. It's a very a lot of material here to, to cover. But Jesus tells his apostles because... There were 12 apostles, and they were following their, their leader, God's Son. Well, and he was referred to as the light of the world. Well, of course, the Son is the light of the world. What else lights the world if not the Son? And so his 12 followers, or his 12 apostles, or the 12 signs of the Zodiac, or the 12 months of the year, whatever you want to call it, the 12 asked God's Son, now that you're going to die, where are we supposed to go? What's next? And in the book of Luke, in the New Testament, Luke 22, 10, go read it, uh, God's Son, the light of the world, said uh, to, the 12, to his 12 followers, go into the city and you will see a man carrying a water pitcher. Go into the house of the man with the water pitcher. Well, one thing Bible uh, scholars know that Christians don't is that nowhere in the Middle East, in any country, uh, in biblical times or today, nowhere 
does uh, do men carry water pitchers? In the Middle East, it is a woman's job to carry water, not a man, period. It would have been a shame to see a man carrying water. That's a woman's job. And this is why Jesus was always talking about to the women at the well. Women carry water, not men, period. Therefore, why would Jesus say, go into the city and see the man carrying the water pitcher? Go into the house of the man with the water pitcher. Well, anybody who's got modicum of sins knows that the symbol for Aquarius is a man with a water pitcher. And anyone who's done any research at all, which most Christians haven't, but if you have, you will know that the symbol for Christianity and the ancient Roman Empire was two fish, crossing two fish. That's why Jesus feeds his crowd with two fish, the, the book of Luke. The two fish are, of course, obviously, the symbol for Pisces, the age of religion in the Roman Empire, and it started about the 4th century. So Jesus represents the master of the, uh, of the age of Pisces. He feeds, he feeds his flock with two fish, Pisces. Get it? And then with the, when he's getting ready to leave the world, 2,000 years later, he's getting ready to leave the world, his 12 followers, the 12 uh, signs of the zodiac, the 12 months of the year, the 12, brothers, uh, the 12 brothers of Jonah, the 12 apostles, by God, there's all kinds of 12s in the Bible, and nobody seems to have put it together. The 12 are the 12 signs of the zodiac, the 12 months of the year, okay? So when you see the 12, uh, the 12 followers of the sun asking, where are we to go now? Because we've been in the age of the two fishes, now where are we to go? Well, the, the master of the, of, the, of the Piscean age says, go into the house with a man with a water pressure. Well, obviously, if you've got 500 brain cells, you know that Aquarius follows Pisces. And so the next sign should be a, 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 a Aquarius. And so, well, let's go backwards. Let's go backwards before Jesus, before uh, the inauguration of the age of Pisces. What were we in then? Well, if you go back to the time of Moses, uh, Moses was, uh, even before Moses, the world was in the age of Taurus, the bull. And therefore the Jews of the ancient Hebrews were worshipers of God's son, the light of the world, in the age of Taurus, the bull. That's why you have the golden calf. The sun is golden and a calf is from a bull. So the golden calf was the sun in the age of Taurus. Now, when this, the end of the age of Taurus was coming, um, God calls Moses up to the mountain to give him a new law. And he goes up into the mountain. He gets the new understanding, the new revelation, the new law, and comes back down to give to the Hebrew people. And what does he do if he finds the people worshiping a golden calf. Why it's telling you that the people were still worshiping the way they were in the age of, of uh, Taurus the bull. Moses comes down and says, we've got a new arrangement. God just gave us a new age, a new time. And he is the, that means we are now in the age of Aries, the ram. And therefore, instead of worshiping the golden calf, we're now supposed to blow the ram's horn. And so it, it's really interesting how today we are we're seeing the Jews worshiping the you know, blowing the ram's horn and never ever suspected that it's all astrology, the whole thing. So um, an astrotheological metaphor or allegory for the, the movement of the sun through the procession of the equinoxes. That's exactly what it is. And if you're hearing fireworks, it's because there's a big celebration uh, here in the city and fireworks. And so don't get excited. That's all it is. Not a problem at all, Jordan. Jordan, stay right with us. We'll pick this up on the other side of this break. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to What on Earth is Happening. My special guest this evening, Jordan Maxwell. Stay with us.
Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to What on Earth is Happening. I'm your host, Mark Passio. My special guest this evening, Jordan Maxwell. Jordan, uh, I want to shift gears a little bit and uh, go into some even deeper waters, uh, if we can. Um, Can you tell us your general view of human origins? And uh, do you think it's a possibility that in our ancient past there was a direct non-human intervention in the uh, creation of humanity or at least the creation of the current human condition, whether that was done through uh, possibly genetic or epigenetic manipulation? Your take on that. Well, another good question. Um, I, there's no doubt in my mind what, what has transpired. I've said many years ago that the word evolution and the concept of evolution uh, is, is incorrect to look at. The evolution is not important. The word you need to look at, the conceptual idea you need to research is intervention, not evolution. Uh, let me explain. The Bible clearly says, and I, I'm, I, I'm fascinated with the wisdom that's encoded in the Bible. It's not there uh, for anyone to just sit and read. But if you do the, the homework on breaking down the words and the etymology of the words and going back into the ancient language of archaeolinguistics, which is a study of the ancient languages, and the ancient concepts and ideas of the of the pre uh, you know the prehistoric world and how it's come down to us today, you will begin to see how there's a lot of fascinating stuff encoded in the Bible that Christians and Jews didn't see. I would so I would say this that uh, the Bible does not say uh, that God created man. I used to sit and talk with rabbis many years ago at the Solomon and Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies in Los Angeles. I'm talking about many, many years ago, and even before that, back in the 60s, with uh, rabbinical friends of mine. And um, it, it became apparent that, uh, from what they were saying, that they were, uh, that they were intimating that God did not create man. And so I got interested in that. I said, wait a minute, what are you saying? And the rabbi said, first of all, God, the, the scriptures do not say God created man. That's, uh, that's a new flung, that's a new idea. It's a new concept. It has nothing to do with Judaism or ancient Judaism or the Bible at all. No, nowhere does it say God created man. Go back and read it correctly. And, uh, and so I began to see that he was right. Because the word man in Hebrew is ish, I-S-H. Ish is man in Hebrew. But in the Bible, when it says, and God was was creating Adam and Eve, it doesn't say, and God created ish. It doesn't say that. The word is A-D-M in Hebrew. Adam, not Adam. We added an A and it becomes a nice uh, Jewish name, Adam. No, no, not Adam. A-D-M, Adam, means something in Hebrew. And so the scripture says that God said, come let us make man in our image. Well, the word man there is not ish, it's Adam. So the correct translation, if you if you do it right and go back to the original Hebrew, it's God said, come, let us make Adam in our image after our likeness. That is, and Rabbi told me many years ago, I'm fascinated by this because he said, go back and read the the scripture correctly. It doesn't say God created man. It says, God said, come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Not make man but make a man in our image, after our likeness, so he will look like us. And so I said, wait a minute, God says, come let us? Who is us? And then later on, God looks down on the earth and says, see, man has become as one of us, or Adam has become one of us. And so what are you talking about us? God talking to himself, or who else, who's he talking to? Well. Go back to Genesis 1, when it says, In the beginning, God created the the heavens and the earth. 
that's not what it says in Hebrew. It doesn't say that. Go back and read the word, because in Hebrew, the word uh, for God is El, E-L. El is God. But that's not the word that is in Genesis 1-1, not at all. Go back and read it in Hebrew, and it says, In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, not El. And so Elohim is a plural. It's like putting an S on the end of, a, of an English word. You have C-A-R is one thing, but C-A-R-S means many cars, more than one in the plural. So El is God, but Elohim is a plural, meaning more than one. Therefore, the correct translation, if you want to be accurate, and read it in the Hebrew the way it was actually written, not the way your pastor said, uh, not the way your church teaches, but if you want to go to the original, then it would be correctly translated, in the beginning the gods created the heavens and the earth, more than one. So then when we hear that the Hebrews or the ancient Jews or the ancient Hebrews were the worshipers of one God, they were the first monotheistic people. In point of fact, that is absolutely ludicrous on the face of it. The Hebrews have never been a monotheistic people ever in history. You cannot prove that at all. They have never been a worshiper of one God. What the term is, is not uh, monotheistic. It's heno, spelled H-E-N-O. Go look it up in a dictionary. H-E-N-O, heno, means, henotheistic means to pick one God from a group. So uh, to understand what I'm saying is if you have, say, 15 gods, and they're all equal, and they're standing in front of you, and you pick one God that you are, you're, uh, he is your favorite. So you pick one God. And you tell him, I want to make a pact with you. You'll be my God, and I will be your, your, your follower. Well, what you've done now is you have picked one God from a group. So we could say you are the worshiper of one God. But that's not saying that there's only one God. No, it's the one God you picked. And that's why, uh, correctly understood, the Hebrews were a henotheistic people. They picked one God. And that's why today we could say that they were worshippers of one God. But then when you understand who were the other gods, well, that's why in the Bible it says God said, no, Elohim said, the God said, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So it's not saying that gods, the gods made man-ish. No, the gods made a new kind of man. They came here and intervened in our uh, evolution and created a new kind of creature that the Hebrew call Adam, A-D-M. Look it up in a dictionary. So therefore, when you understand, and, and, and to, to go on with this whole thing, it opens up a can of worms. Because in either uh, Genesis 9-1, uh, after the flood of Noah's day, in Genesis 9, 1, this is after the flood, <clears throat> it says that God said, <clears throat> excuse me, God says to Noah and his, and his family after the flood, go forth, multiply, and replenish the earth. So I asked the rabbis, is that a correct translation, go forth, multiply, and re, R -E, replenish the earth? because re means to do it again. And the rabbi said, yes, obviously, if, God, if there were many people on the earth and God has just destroyed mankind with a great flood, well, if you're going to have people on the earth again, then somebody's going to have to re, R-E, do it again, replenish the earth. Makes sense. And I said to the rabbi, all right, if that be the case, then what about Genesis 1.28? when God is creating Adam and Eve, and he says, go forth, multiply, and replenish the earth. Do it again. Does that mean that Adam and Eve were a new creation, a recreation of a new kind of creature? Yes, 
obviously in your face. There were there has been civilizations on this earth for millions of years. Fascinating information, Jordan. Ladies and gentlemen, stay right with us. We'll be back after these words in the second hour of tonight's broadcast. My special guest, JordanMaxwell.com. Today, of course, my special guest, preeminent occult researcher, Mr. Jordan Maxwell. Uh, Before the break, Jordan was talking about the possibility that uh, non-human entities had intervened in the possible creation of the human species, not only the current human condition, but... uh, uh, may possibly be the, quote, gods that the biblical texts of the Old text- Testament talked about. As he said, the word Elohim is actually plural in Hebrew, and it means gods. Um, uh, Jordan, I want to ask you, I want to get your take. Uh, you know, we talk about the, the possibility that these uh, beings came here and had, uh, you know, their own intentions in mind and didn't really care too much about us. They were going to use us for their purposes, uh, and, you know, then uh, certain gr- groups of human beings chose w- one faction, perhaps, of these gods or one of these beings a- among the many to worship and to venerate. Um, but uh, h- how do you see um, the possibility of there being uh, po- the possibility of positive non-human entities or presences <clears throat> that are here to uh, not use humanity, but to uplift humanity so that we might pursue our evolutionary development on our own. Do you see any possible presences that are here to assist us? I don't think so. No? No, I don't think so. I think that uh, if you look at the whole picture, and something I would add to what we said before, uh, remember in the Ten Commandments, uh, the God, that particular God, Yahweh, that uh, was picked by the Hebrews, that particular God, said one of the commandments he laid down on that new arrangement, that those people who chose him, he said, I am the Lord your God, and I shall not have strange gods before me. I am the Lord your God not almighty God of the whole universe. No, I am the God you chose. So I am the Lord, your God, and I shall not have other gods before me. He didn't say there were no other gods. I just don't want you worshiping any other God because you made an agreement with me. And so it's like the guy telling the girlfriend, I'm going to be your steady, I'm going to be your boyfriend. I don't want to see you with other boys. I'm, I'm your boyfriend. I'm your steady. I don't want to see you dating other people. Well, the concept was the same. The God that they picked said, I am the Lord, your God. And I don't want any other gods coming before me. I don't care if you want to dabble with uh, some of their silly stuff, but don't worship any gods before me, because I'm the one that you picked. I'm the Lord, your God. So when you understand how this, these uh, scriptures are to be interpreted correctly, and how the words uh, in the Bible are, are telling you something, it's encoded. And people don't understand it being uh, words that are encoded, symbolic. That's why they even ask Jesus. Uh, they ask Jesus, why is it you talk in riddles? And you're only talking, the only, and the Bible said, the only talk in riddles, only. That's the only way uh, Jesus taught was in riddles. <clears throat> in in, uh, in uh, what was the other term that was used? But the point being is you're only talking to riddles, and then Jesus said, I talk in riddles because I don't want you getting saved. I don't want you around me. I don't want you hearing and getting saved. I don't want you around me at all. So I speak in such a way that the whole world will hear me, but only those who the Father calls will understand what I'm really saying. Only those who uh, are truly spiritual and who are chosen by the Father will hear. The rest of you will all just, you know, you look with your eyes, you don't see, and you listen with your ears, and you don't hear, and with your heart, you don't get the sense of it. So that's why I talk in riddles and teach in, uh, in uh, riddles, is because I don't want you to understand them. Um, most people, I don't want them in, in my company. So I, I, I get the point. This is why things are encoded in government. Government encodes 
messages because they don't want other people to read these. If, if it gets out, people won't be able to read what the government's saying because it's encoded. And so that's why today I'm saying that both the Old and New Testament are heavily encoded. Well, my God, we've heard all kinds of, of books and lectures about Bible codes. Well, you better go back and look at that idea because it's true. There are codes in the Bible, biblical codes. And, and so when you start looking at words and terms, as the rabbis used to tell me, you know, the way you Gentiles read something, you've got your own take on it, and you proclaim yourself to know what you're talking about. You've got your own claim. When in point of fact, there are in codes, there are coded messages in there that the rabbinical authorities know that you don't know. And so you, you need to go back and do your homework. If you're going to translate something correctly, you better go back and look at the culture of the people who wrote it, what the words meant back then, not what they mean today, and look at the entire picture as an encoded message. And when you do that, you begin to see that there's more than one God, there's many gods, and when Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, uh, Cain kills his brother, and God is going to ban banish him from, from his family and take him away and send him out into the wilderness for Cain says to God, oh my God, don't send me out there. I'll be a vagabond, and if you send me out there, they're going to find me. And when they find me, they're going to kill me. And, uh, and God says, no, I'm not going to let them kill you. I'll put a mark on you so they may find you, and they're not going to kill you. And, and you, you've got to ask yourself, what are you talking about? There's Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Cain just killed his brother. And now God is sending him out into the world, and Cain says to God, don't send me out there because anybody out there that finds me will kill me. And now he's got God believing there's somebody out there because God says, no, I won't let them kill you if they find you. Who are you talking about that's in the, out there that, that will, that's different from you and they'll kill you if they find you? Who? I thought there was only three people at this point, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. And now, now there's only three people because I, one killed the other one. So what are you talking about? Well, what we're talking about is that there have been civilizations on this earth for millions and millions of years. The, the, the history of life, human intelligent life or intelligent life, goes back millions of years. And this is why it says, again, I'm saying this is why it says in Genesis 1, 28, when God is creating Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, Go forth, multiply, and replenish the earth. Do it again. So you need to you need to understand that there's a bigger picture here, and most people have no idea how big this picture really is, how far back it goes. We're finding temples, enormous structures, in the oceans of the world. We're finding pyramids. On the ocean, on the ocean floor in the Atlantic, we're finding enormous structures and temples off the coast of, uh, of Cuba, off the coast of Japan, Okinawa. We're finding enormous temples around the world on in the bottom of oceans. What does that tell you? When the oil rigs are drilling into the earth and the oceans, they go down miles beneath the ocean to hit the oil. But before they hit the oil, they're sucking up the, the stuff that they're cutting through, and they're finding handmade artifacts under the ocean floor. Wake up. You need to wake up and find out that the earth has got a history you're not aware of. And I think what you're saying in so many words is that in this uh, um, replenishing of the earth after the deluge, what was really being done was they were just rebooting the matrix of slavery all over again. That's it. You got it. We'll be right back, everyone. Stay with us. Thanks, well. Jordan, on the uh, other side of the break, you were uh, talking about, you know, that uh, there have been many, many ancient civilizations going back for possibly even millions of years, and this system of slavery has really been 
ongoing and uh, has been you know wiped out and rebooted possibly several times. Um, to switch that back to what's going on in the modern world, obviously we're still uh, entrenched in a system of control and slavery. So uh, I wanted to, I want to ask you what could be construed as a controversial question, but here it goes anyway. Uh, what is your personal take on the ideology that is referred to as pacifism? And um, let me get your take on that first. And then the second part of this question I want to ask is, is there an inherent right of self-defense uh, on the part of people who other individuals consider as their slaves or their property to uh, use their uh, physical ability, their physical power to physically rebel and free themselves from that imposed condition that is imposed upon them called slavery. Well, yeah, I, I think that whole thing borders on, uh, on, on the obvious. <clears throat> it, it's really a philosophical question, uh, how you view uh, freedom. I mean, I, I'm in the system that I live in. I, I'm not complaining about it. I live in the system. I understand it. Uh, I, I'm the one who's been talking about it for many years, about how the system works. And, uh, but I, I, as a matter of fact, I don't have any problem with it as such, because I realize it's just part of, it is what it is. It's part of the continual flow of power over the human creatures and over the uh, you know, intelligent creatures of the earth have always been dominated by uh, occult powers, by hidden, uh, the hidden powers of the world. We call them Illuminati today. I don't care what you call it. Obviously, uh, at the top of the world, you can go like in the organized crime. You have the street criminals, and then their captains, the capos, and then after that, you have you know, the, the heads of the families, and after that you've got the commission, and after that you get the other, and it just keeps going up the ladder and up the ladder until finally it comes to uh, the bottom line. The bottom line is the big boss, boss of all bosses at the top. Well, the boss of all bosses at the top in this, the, in this theological world, I believe, are demonic. I believe that this is what the scripture says, the Bible says, that all of your gods are demons, and you're worshiping the, the, the worship of demons and devils. I think there's probably something to that, because I think that's exactly what's happening. I think religions today are the, uh, are the product of higher other-world intelligences who have, are misleading the whole human race, and that's the whole race. You know, go back to the scripture where it says that Jesus was taken to uh, the pinnacle of the temple and shown all the kingdoms of the world, said, I will give you all these kingdoms if you'll worship me. Well, obviously, you couldn't give all the kingdoms of the world if you don't own them. Well, the scripture actually says the God of this world is the devil, and, and, and all the religions of the world are from the devil, from evil, demonic, depravity. Well, again, like we started to show off again by saying, by their fruits you shall know them. So what is the fruitage of, of uh, the three major religions uh, in the world today? Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Is world chaos, world wars, violence. And we can start dissecting each one of those religions and begin to see the real story behind what these religions really are, where they've come from. And uh, then you get into the sexual perversions and the lies and the money grubbing and all the entertainment, the propaganda and the wars and the violence and the mistreatment of children and the, and the, you know, and the horrible stuff there, the circumcision of children and, and babies and cutting the, the foreskins off of children, uh, the baby's penis and sucking the blood. What is all of this incredible stuff that we humans are subjected to and nobody has seemed to question, where does this stuff come from? Where do these ideas about God, and I remember back in you know, school many years ago, teacher emphasized the point, when you're discussing something with other people, define your terms. Understand that other people may have a different view of the word you're using. So that's why I always ask when we're talking about theology, 
Uh, that's another very interesting word, theology, because it goes back to the word um, uh, theos, which is God in Greek. Theos or theo in Greek is God. That's why you, and so in the ancient Greeks, when they used to go to uh, hear about God, Christians go to churches. Well, the ancient Greeks, they didn't go to churches. They went to theaters. So it was called the God Show. They went to a theater. And to the theater talked to them about theism or uh, theology. So this is where today we get the idea that uh, when you go into a big show, you're going into a theater. Well, that's what you do when you go into a, a, a church. You're going into church. It's a theater. It's a show, the God Show. And people pay money, and they and they are entertained, and then they go out, and they they are edified because they saw a good movie, they they heard a good sermon or something. Does it mean you've learned anything? No, no. The same people have gone to the same church for forty six years, and you can ask them a question, a theological question, and they can't answer it. They don't know what you're talking about. So I've got to say to myself, if you've been going to a theater, or to a or to a class in a theater, or to a church. For 40 years, and I ask you a question and you can't answer it, that tells me how good of an education you've been getting at this theater or this church, which is by their fruits, you shall know them. So when you start breaking down religion, you find out that the people who are very religious also are totally ignorant, ill-informed, unread, and have no understanding of the word God and where it comes from. They have no concept of what you're talking about when you talk, they use the term Christ, Christos, Christ, Jesus. Where did these words come from? So God, as I've always said, I'm famous for saying it, is that God is simply dog, spelled backwards. And that's why you have dogma in the church. You, you begin to understand the etymology of the hidden or occult significance of religions, where they have come from. Why do we only have three major religions like Islam, Judaism, Christianity? Why three? There's a reason why. Why do all religions, almost all religions in the world, have triune gods? The, you know, the Hindus have Brahma, Vishnu, Siva. The Egyptians have Osiris, Isis, Horus. The, the Christians have uh, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And the Jews have uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. All ancient religions have a triune God. Why? It goes back very, very far, and there's a very good reason for the concept of a triune God. The triune God is one God, but three divine persons. Well, it goes back to sun worship. The sun in the morning was the newborn Savior, and the sun is your Savior, and it does rise. It rises every morning, so he was your risen Savior. And if you don't think the sun is your savior, wait till it don't come up. So the sun was your risen savior. At noon, the sun became known in the ancient world as the most high. Why? Because it don't get any higher than high noon. So therefore, he's the most high. Later on, he's dying. So therefore, as the baby in the born in the morning, he becomes full grown at 12 noon. And now he's going to die at his old age. Three persons in one God. Hold that thought right there. We're coming up to another break, ladies and gentlemen. My special guest tonight, Jordan Maxwell. Stay with us. Host Mark Passio, my website, whatonearthishappening.com. This evening, my special guest, occult researcher, Jordan Maxwell. Before we go back to asking Jordan a couple more questions, I have just a couple more questions I want to run by Jordan, uh, and then we're going to go to your calls in the third hour. Uh, I want to give Jordan the opportunity in this uh, second hour, uh, se second half of this hour, to uh, let the listening audience uh, know about a uh, very uh, stressful situation that he's been undergoing uh, regarding actually, of all things, his own name. Jordan, do you want to uh, inform the audience about this? <clears throat> yes, well, thank you. Uh, it, it is uh, very distressing. You have no idea how distressing it is. It's, um, you know, because I, I'm 70, almost 74 years old, I don't really understand the technology of today. I, I, uh, I've, got a <clears throat> I've got a phone, cell phone. I don't know how to use it. Uh, I'm just, you know, doing the best I can.
can't we just work here on computers? Uh, and so I don't really understand the technology of today. I've studied my subject. And so I have to depend on somebody to help me <clears throat> because I have nothing. I own nothing. I have no property. I don't own a home. I don't have a family. Uh, I have no checkbook, no credit card, no car. I own and have nothing. So I have to depend on someone who's younger, <clears throat> excuse me, to help me to do my work. All I want is to put my work out into the world and, and, and do what I do. But I need help doing that because I don't understand the technology. So when someone comes to visit me, which people do all the time, they come to visit me, and they see how I live with nothing, <clears throat> they say, oh, my God, let, let, you know, let me help you. Oh, we want to help you. And I say, I wish you would. I appreciate if somebody would help me. So they say, oh, yeah, let me, let me, uh, let me do your, <clears throat> your website for you. <clears throat> Excuse me, and and we'll handle your uh, distribution of product, and we'll do the you know, we'll connect your email for you, and we'll just help you, and and so all we need to do is uh, we need to get permission to do this from you, so we need you to sign this uh, piece of paper that gives us permission to be your webmaster, and do all this stuff for you, and so I do, I uh, sign it, <clears throat> and then they have my web now they have ownership of my website. Uh, for me, and so what happens in, uh, and has happened is uh, when I found out the, the webmaster I had four years ago, four or five, four and a half years ago, uh, when I found out that this young man was not who I thought he was, and I found out his proclivities and who he and what what his private life is really like, I didn't know. I'm just an old man, and the young man comes in wants to help me. But when I found out what he was really all about, um, it shocked me, and I, I and so I, I decided I don't want you to be in, I don't want you in my company anymore. I don't want you to do anything for me anymore. Just give me back my website, and you go your way, and I'll go mine. To which he said, "Oh no, no, nobody walks away from me." And so I found out that uh, he went into the back of my website and changed the ownership from my name to his name. He changed the uh, email, uh, my private email that I'd had with my website. He redirected my private email to himself. And, of course, he had already uh, redirected the bank account to his personal bank account. And then behind my back, not knowing it, he went to, sent, uh, to uh, Washington, D.C. and copyrighted all of, my, all of my books and tapes and videos that I've produced over the years and copyrighted them all <clears throat> behind my back, and I didn't know anything about it. Then he went to the trademark department and tried to trademark my name so that he would actually own my name, my products, my money, my email, my bank account, everything. He owns it all. And when I confronted him on this, he said, look it, just get out there and make me some money. And so at that point, I, I was devastated. I didn't realize the depth that people will go, because I've had people cheating me before, but this this took the cake. I've never had anyone steal everything I own and then talk to me like I was a fool. So I had to talk to lawyers, and the lawyers, of course, would say, oh, well, this is terrible. We could do something about this, but it's going to cost you 10000 I don't have a nickel. I never have had any money, and whatever money I did have, it goes to him now. So. For years, for the past four years, all the products that have been sold on my old website, jordanmaxwell.com, uh, jordanmaxwell.com has not belonged to me for four years uh, because my webmaster, he's the one that has the, the codes and the passwords and the username. I don't. I never knew anything about usernames. I don't know anything about passwords and codes. I'm 74 years old, but he does. So he went into my website, stole my website, stole my money, redirected my emails, which is mail fraud, I'm told, by attorneys. And now people writing me all over the world uh, goes to him. And he answers as if it was me. And, and he's sending out uh, uh, and, you know, invitations to, to, uh, to donate money to Jordan Maxwell. He needs your help, financial help. And so people are sending money to him. Unbelievable. 
unbelievable criminality in, in, in your face. But I can't do anything about it because I'm broke. I have nothing. I've been, my life's work has been stolen from me. And so the best I can do is just get a lawyer if I had the money. So I've had some people come in and say, Jordan, let us help you. You don't have to sign anything. You don't have to give us your life's work. We're not going to steal from you. We'll get you a good attorney, and we'll put a Kickstarter or something up there, uh, some kind of a donate button to at least get some money in to get an attorney to get your life back, to get my work back. So that's why I have a little radio show that was done for me. And I, I don't know anything about radio. I mean, how to put a show together. I just do what I do. But I have a radio show now. It's a little podcast called Jordan Maxwell Show. Very simple. The Jordan Maxwell Show. And on that, uh, I've got about 36 little, uh, 36 different shows. It's all free. I have guests on, and I talk them, you know, rattle on myself on my own show. But it's a, a podcast, Jordan Maxwell Show. And if you go there, there's a button for a Kickstarter, and there's another button there for a direct donation to me. <clears throat> so I'm just asking anyone who would like to help me get my life back and, and be able to pay an attorney because I've got a very good uh, copyright, motion picture copyright attorney who, <clears throat> who saw my plight and said, Jordan, this is criminal. Let me take care of this in court. I'll do this. I'm going to get your life back, your, your money and everything else that was stolen from you. So, yeah, but, you know, attorneys cost money and I don't have any. Well, he's, he's working on it anyway. And, so I appreciate that, but I would like to be able to pay him, and I'd like to also continue to do the radio shows, but I don't have the money for that, too, because you know as well as I do, it costs a little money to do a radio show continually. I don't have anything. Sure, so, all these exp expenses associated with equipment, with uh, bandwidth, with, uh, you know, hosting. Uh, it's not free, as many people think, you know. It's, a, it's, right. it's not as easy as people think it is to do as far as, you know, the technical know-how goes. You know, uh, That's right. when I edit this podcast, I mean, I sit here for, uh, you know, an hour or two, even after the show is done, I edit out the commercials, I have to upload it to a site, I have to build an article on a, a, a content management system. It's not like you press a button and a podcast puts it, hosts itself, you know, it doesn't happen no, that that's way. That's exactly right, and I don't know how to do any of that. I don't even know, I, I'm just learning how to, how to work on computers, I don't know how to do that. But I have a dear friend, a couple of guys that have come in to help me, and they put they put a, a website together for their podcast and the show, and they put a little uh, Kickstarter up there so I can uh, have a Kickstarter. And, and Jordan, by, the, by the way, I've heard your new radio show, The New Incarnation, the Jordan Maxwell Show, and I just want to say it's absolutely brilliant. It's really great work that you're doing on that show. Uh, I've listened to them all, and I think it's a, a phenomenal show and uh let's be very clear and tell the the audience the exact website that is yours okay it is yes. jordan maxwell show.com that is your okay. now official website mm -hmm. so I'm anybody sure that is going to any other website that is not jordan maxwell's official site and if you are putting any kind of donations toward that site or buying anything through that site that is not going to Jordan. None of those proceeds will go to Jordan. The only right. site that is valid for Jordan is jordanmaxwellshow.com. Be very specific and make sure you get to that correct site. Exactly so Jordan, right. we'll pick this Thank up you. on the other side of the break. Ladies and gentlemen, sure. don't go anywhere. You're listening to What on Earth is Happening with my special guest for this evening, Jordan Maxwell. We'll be right back. I'm your host, Mark Passio. My website, whatonearthishappening.com. My special guest this evening, occult researcher Jordan Maxwell. Jordan, uh, in this segment, I'll let you uh, wrap up your thoughts on the uh, very unfortunate uh, series of events that have uh, been conducted against you. Uh, let's call this what it really is. This is pure and simple identity crime. I mean, the, 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 this right. individual stole your very identity and, uh, and, and stole, you know, the proceeds of your, your life's work and the research that you've done over the many years. And uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, continue and wrap up what you want to uh, tell the listening audience regarding that situation. Well, it's true. That's exactly what happened. I mean, uh, when I found out, like I said, what caused this is when I found out <clears throat> what his private life was all really about, I wanted nothing more to do with him. And I told him that. I said, because, you know, you work for me. 
uh, you know, I, I, you're supposed to be my friend and helping me. You're younger than I am. I brought you in to help me. I don't want you around me. I don't want to be, have nothing to do with you now. Now, and, you know, and so his response was, okay, I own you now. I own you. I own your name. I own your product. I own your bank account. I own everything. So now you're gonna, you know, you're not gonna get rid of me. I own you. So I was told by him. I was told you need to get out there, old man, and make me some money because I own you. I own your name. I own your website. I own your your email, your bank account, your products. Uh, you know, he filled out he filled out an affidavit on the penalty of perjury. And sent it to uh, the trademark department to trademark my name, then steal my name from me. Well, he got caught on that one. The feds caught him on that one. And so he backed off of that. But he still uh, copyrighted all my products, stole everything from me, and left me penniless. And so that's why my friends have put this, um, you know, this donate button up to uh, ho hopefully donate some money so that I can pay my lawyer and get my life back. That's, that's the bottom line. Jordan, so, do, you, do, you want out, you. do you want to out this individual by name on the air here tonight? Well, I think it's I think it's already out there. I think it's already out there. His name was Joseph, J-O-S-E-F, Joseph Dolezal, D-O-L-E-C-A-L, Dolezal. And it's his father and his brother. There are three I mean, of them in the company. There are three of them in the company. Joseph Dolezal and uh, Jacob Dolezal. Yeah, and, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad father. you're naming them by name because it's, it's good that people should know not to deal with individuals like this, and the only way they're going to know is if they're outed by name right there. So that that's I what. Think so too. Yeah. Besides, it's already out there on the lawsuits. If you go to uh, go to the federal trademark department, you'll see where they signed it and and tried to trademark my name and stole my money and. Uh, and Jacob Dolezal told me, we've got a new plan for you, old man. You're going to get out there and make us some money. So get off your lazy butt and get out there and start making us some money. Unreal. So at that point, I, I just, I, you know, this is a 26-year-old uh, kid, and uh, he's telling me at 74, stuff like that. So That's, that's most people's God, put. unfortunately. That's the God that they worship, you know? Yeah, I know. That's it. And so... Well, so Jordan, I, I will be sure with this podcast to include the proper link to your site, and I'll have a link there for your Kickstarter campaign as well. And uh, that is uh, under the player for tonight's show. If you're listening at the what on earth is happening dot com uh, radio show page, you'll see under the player there is a link underneath Jordan's uh, biography, his short bio. There it says uh, you could visit the Jordan Maxwell uh, Kickstarter campaign. So if you uh, feel like Jordan's uh, information has been of value to you uh, through the many years he's been uh, doing this research and providing it uh, for people, um, you can uh, make a donation at that Kickstarter page. So, um, Jordan, uh, if uh, you want to do a few more questions in the sure. remainder of this segment, and then um, we'll go to some calls in the next segment and hear what listeners have, have to ask, okay? Um, sounds good. Great. Okay. Um, just a couple of uh, quick personal questions, if I may. Um, what do you, What would you say to you is pr the most influential? If you had to pick one single influential book that you want to one book to recommend to people, uh, what would that most single influential book on your entire mindset throughout your life ha have been, and why? Well, that's really a difficult question because I've had hundreds of reference books and. One half of them are priceless pieces of work, and, and they are profoundly important. But uh, uh, I guess I would have to say, uh, for especially if you're interested in the modern-day world that you're living in, uh, the book is called Fire in the Minds of Men. F-I-R-E, Fire in the Minds of Men. It's written by James Billington. And James Billington today is the chief librarian for the Library of Congress. So you don't get any more academically uh, correct than the chief librarian for the Library of Congress. And he has written many books, but this one particular thick volume called Fire in the Minds of Men is a mind trip reading it. This, this guy is an incredible storyteller, but he documents. All of the occultism in politics, religion, secret societies, the emblems, the words, the terms, the Illuminati, where the Democratic and Republican Party really came from, 
and talks about the Illuminati, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the sects, the cults, and the money, the banking industry, the whole entire dirty world of hidden knowledge, hidden power, hidden wisdom, the chief library for the Library of Congress, James Billington, wrote a phenomenal book called Fire in the Minds of Men. That should take you about 10 years to go through that one. All right, great. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's see what all other questions do I have here. How about if you could spend some time with any individual, li uh, living or deceased, past or present, okay, and you could pick their brain for a while, who would it be and why? Well, again, I, I, I'd have to think about that because that, there have been so many brilliant people that I've already been in the, pro in the presence of all my life. I have been, been blessed uh, to be in the company of extraordinarily brilliant people. Uh, I think it would be my girlfriend's father, my first girlfriend in California, her father. Uh, I would love to be able to sit and talk with him again. Uh, but that's a personal thing because he was one of the most extraordinary experiences I've ever had. My first girlfriend and her father, you may have, you may have heard me tell the story about it, <clears throat> and about him and, and my girlfriend when I was 19 years old. But uh, he was an extraordinary man, and I would love to be able to talk with him again. Uh, have you ever heard the story I told about, the, about my girlfriend and his father, and her father? I, I have not. Go ahead. Well, uh, it was back in 1959, and I'm 19 years old, 19-year-old kid, freshly from Florida, and I'm in Los Angeles, in high, uh, North Hollywood. And one morning, I go into the restaurant in downtown North Hollywood, 1959. And uh, there, was a, there was no room anywhere except uh, one, one chair at the, uh, at the uh, counter. So I'm sitting down next to this young girl. I'm 19. She was probably 17, 18. And we get to talking and found out she only lived a couple blocks from me and I only lived about three blocks in town. She had walked downtown. I had too. So we walked back home together. And so we started meeting each other on weekend downtown and would walk home. And so, but she lived about two blocks further than I did. So she knew where I lived, but I never followed her home. So I didn't know exactly where she lived. And one night she came over to my house and she said, uh, my dad wants to talk to you. And of course, I wasn't interested to talk to her father. She said, no, my father is very important, very interesting, and he wants to tell you something. So I thought that sounded interesting. So I went with her. And when I went there, to cut it short, um, the, her, my girlfriend, and her younger sister, they, she, the two girls sat on the floor. The mother was in the kitchen. The father and I sat on a long sofa. He sat on one end, and I sat on the other. And we were talking, and, uh, you know, just small talk, asking me how I, if I'm working and how you like the job and how long have you been here, et cetera, et cetera. And so I felt all right about him, but there was something very, very, very strange about him. But I felt confident and, and, and uh, wasn't threatened because he was talking about normal things that I could relate to. And so in the conversation, uh, he then, when I was feeling all right about him, because he realized I was very sensitive to who he was, and, uh, and then he said to me, he said, remember back when you were eight years old and when your dad built a new back porch back in Florida? And your uncle helped you with your dad build a new back porch. Remember that? He tore, he tore down the old back porch, and he built a new one. And he built the back porch with green lumber, and it smelled funny. Remember, you were about eight years old, and, and, and your dad built a new back porch. You remember doing that happening? And it frightened me. I, I didn't want to show tears in front of my girlfriend, but it scared me, because he was right. I did do and my dad did build a back porch when I was eight. And how in the world would he know that? And then he said to me, he said, now remember one night you were in bed, you were supposed to be sleeping, but you got up and you went out in the back porch and looked at the moon, and the moon was full. You remember doing that? And I just looked at him, because I do remember doing that. And he said, then you looked up at the moon, and you, was, you were picking the wood with your finger, because it smelled funny at night, the green lumber. 
and you were picking the pieces of, you know, with your finger and putting it in your mouth like a toothpick, remember? And I just looked at him because he was absolutely frightening me. I had no idea in the world how he knew that. And he said to me, well, how in the world did I know that? And I said, I don't know how you know that. He said, well, did you do what I said? I said, yes, you're right. And he said, well, how would I know that? And I, I don't know. And he said, well, I was there. I saw you. We'll pick we this up there. on the other side of the break. Stay with us, folks. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to What on Earth is Happening. We're into the third hour for this evening with my special guest, occult researcher Jordan Maxwell. Jordan, I'll let you uh, uh, wrap up the story that you were telling about uh, a uh, former girlfriend's father, and uh, 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 I'll let you pick it up where you left off before the, uh, the last break. Yeah, so he said to me in front of the two girls, as I said, sitting on the floor, and he and I all sitting on the sofa, and and he said, uh, you know, he told me about my dad building a back porch with my uncle, which, which, which he did. And he said that he used green lumber and it smelled funny, which it did. And then he said that one night, he said you were supposed to be in bed, but you got up and you went out and sat on the back porch and you were looking at the full moon, which I did. I remember that distinctly. And he said, uh, and then you talked to God, didn't you? And I just looked at him. He said, well, did you or didn't you? I said, yes, I did. And he said, well, what did you say to God? And I didn't say anything to him. I just looked at him. He said, well, I'll tell you what you said. Uh, you said to God that you wanted to do something important with your life. You wanted your life to have a purpose, for something to do. And, and uh, you wanted your life to be important, to do something with it. And uh, he said, so is that what you said? And I looked at him and I said, yes, that's what I said. And he said to me, how did I know that? How would I know all of this? And I said, I don't know how you know. I have no idea how you know this. And he said, I know this because we were there. We were right there watching you. And I said, what do you mean we were watching me? He said, we were there. How would I know everything that you did if I wasn't there? And I said, I don't understand what you mean. And he said, well, it's not important. What you need to know is that we've been watching you for a long time. We, and you did ask. After all, you did ask. So we're going to give you an opportunity to do something with your life. And he said, but what you're going to do for us, you will not do to the very last part of your life. So just understand, we have something for you to do, and you will do it. But it will not come until the very last part of your life. So I asked him, I said, so what is it I'm supposed to do? And he said, that's not important, because even if I explained it to you, you wouldn't understand now. But there will come a day, and when in the last part of your life, where you will know what you have to do and what you're doing. And so, and you'll know what, what we have for you to do. So, uh, uh, as it turns out, that was very startling. That was a very incredible experience. But I do know. I do know what I have to do, what I'm doing, and why I do it. But uh, I do it to help my fellow man, to awaken my fellow man. And, and I thought I was doing something of value to help people to research and wake up. And, to, and so I started talking about the conspiracies in government back in 1959, 60, 61. I was going around giving lectures. Uh, at Little Mickey Mouse occasions, like in bookstores and women's clubs and all that, back in the early 60s and 70s. Um, so, you know, and so it's been, been my life's work. Well, now I'm toward the end of my life's work, now I'm 74 years old, I now see that all the things I was talking about that were happening, the secret society, the Illuminati, and the Federal Reserve and all the, the Knights Templars and all of these subjects that I've been talking about. I used to talk about these things in Hollywood for years. I would go around to the motion picture studios at night and the, the working class people, not the executive, but the working people would get me in and I'd go into uh, the, the sound stages at night at, uh, and at Warner Brothers and different motion picture uh, studios and give slide presentations, little Mickey Mouse, uh, cheap little slide presentations, 
to a bunch of people. They'd all be on, all, all these were, you know, off from work and they're just sitting on the sound stage and we set up a, a, a camera, I mean, a projector and, and I was sitting talking about the Illuminati and, and, and the occult societies and all the stuff going on behind religion and the, the dark occult forces in the world and Knights Templars and Illuminati and banking and all that. Well, today, now, of course, it's everywhere in Hollywood. Now it's all over. There's Da Vinci Code and the National Treasure and God knows all the rest of it. But this is the stuff I was talking about many, many years ago. And, uh, and today, you, you, you know, today I have far more than I have never told. And, I, and a lot of the stuff I can't talk about in public, but... I've tried my best to alert my fellow man to all the dangers which are going on. And what I've received for it is uh, young people coming in and taking my website, taking my everything I've worked for, stealing it all, and treating me like a fool. So I just, I just, my feeling is at this point, I'm very philosophical about my life, my, my, my mortality. I, I, I've already come to terms with that. I'm not going to be here much longer, so I do the best I can to help my fellow man in the face of people stealing from me, lying to me, and taking everything I own. Uh, but I feel the Dolezals will eventually have to go to jail because they have really committed some serious crimes, and they, they have no idea that there, there are some felonies, big-time felonies, that's going to put them in jail, and it, those days are coming. So I just wait on the great spirit, men have called God, because I believe in God. So I just wait and see what the great spirit will do to, to help me to get my work back and get my life back, because I feel that I still have a lot to do yet in you know, sure. the last, last part of my life. And, and but you I can't will, do and it you will continue people. to do it, and you'll do it effectively because you've been doing the great work for a very long time, and uh, the universe is going to uh, open up its arms and ultimately reward you for having done that work. Uh, that I feel that is the the greatest uh, form of protection that anybody can really uh, bring upon themselves is when they s step into the truth and speak it and do so uh, unapologetically because it is the right thing to do, as you have done. You know, I, I appreciate that because I personally have a very strong belief in the presence of a God. I, there's no doubt in my mind that there's a higher intelligence, profoundly wise and all-powerful, pervading the universe and especially us. But I don't have any problem with God. I have a problem with organized corporate uh, takeover of the world by men who are dark and evil and have uh, sinister plots against the human race. Well, I understand it. I know what it's all about because I've been talking about it for 50 years. But I really would like to get out from under these young punks who have stolen everything from an old man and ridiculed me on my own, uh, on my own website and ridiculed me in public. And at the same time, they're ridiculing me and calling me names. They're trying to sell my, my, my products, obviously, because right. they're making a lot of money while they're ridiculing me. That should tell you something about their mentality. It tells you everything you need to know about their character because their character is based in in the desire for mammon. That's their god, yeah. you know. And and especially that's that's going to bring them cosmic retribution. That being their oh, god, no doubt about it. Yeah. No doubt about it. Absolutely. But especially uh, Joseph Dolezal, the, the the kid, with his private life stuff that I know about. I, I you have no idea in the world what this kid's into. So when I found out, I want nothing more to do with him. And his immediate reaction is, well, okay, what are you going to do about it? I own everything. I'm in control, so I changed everything over to me, so I own it all. And he probably thinks like with, the, with the corrupt court systems and everything that, you know, they'll they'll side in his favor or something like that. That's probably where his mentality is. Yeah. 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 So I do the best I can. I'm still doing what I can do. And Jordan, we, we appreciate you for doing it. So, do uh, you want to take some calls? Absolutely. Let's All go. right, great. Let's go to the phones. Uh, first caller on the line this evening is Jay in Pennsylvania. Jay, welcome. Hello. Jay, is this Jay Parker? Yes. Jay, uh, you, uh, I'm going to get to your call on the other side of the break. A, com a commercial break is, is catching us right here, but stay with us, and you'll be the first person to be able to ask Jordan a question on the other side. 
Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to What on Earth is Happening with my special guest, Jordan Maxwell. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to What on Earth is Happening here on Republic Broadcasting. I'm your host, Mark Passio. My website, whatonearthishappening.com. Special guest this evening, Jordan Maxwell. We were about to go to the phones. I apologize I wasn't paying attention to the time clock in the last segment. So uh, we were on the line with Jay Parker uh, in Philadelphia. Jay uh, is one of the uh, speakers of the first two Free Your Mind conferences right here in Philadelphia. Uh, Jay is also a uh, uh, survivor of satanic ritual abuse, and Jay actually hosts his own show on satanic ritual abuse, and uh, 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 it's a show that also discusses solutions to the problems that humanity faces in our world. Jay, uh, welcome to What on Earth is Happening, and uh, what do you have for us this evening? Well, I just wanted to uh, thank Maxwell, Jordan Maxwell, for all the work he's done. Uh, Certainly a great volume of work, and uh, although the numbers are small, uh, I believe that people who are doing due diligence and researching and studying uh, they they are real human beings and uh, should be encouraged to wake up and to learn these uh, secrets of the occult. I have a question for Jordan pertaining to something that was on his website years ago uh, that I saw. And uh, it was a symbol, uh, like it, it was in a circle, and it was like an electronic symbol. And you were asking if anyone knew what that symbol was on your Mm -hmm. website. And I saw that symbol. I was shown it uh, when I was about five years old in the uh, Illuminati uh, group that I grew up in. And they were asking me if I knew what that symbol was. And I wanted to know if Jordan still had a copy of that symbol and if uh, he could uh, get it to Mark Passio. Yes. Let, let me. Let me. Uh, uh, are you talking about the uh, the symbol where the little arrows pointing all out in all directions from circles and little arrows and long uh, uh, arrows pointing out from a circle? Is that what you were talking about? The one I saw on my I, I put there on my website that I saw this on my uh, on my computer. Is that is that mm-hmm. the same? Yes. Yeah, someone someone sent it to you, I believe, yeah. and you posted it on your website and were asking uh, people, do you know what this is? And I have, I was shown that exact same symbol when I was about five years old, and my mother asked me, she was an Illuminati witch that works for the DuPonts, and uh, she... Uh, by the way, was the one who mind control programmed John DuPont, the heir of the DuPont fortune that killed uh, the wrestler Schultz. Uh, she set him up. And I just want to say that I, I really want to get a hold of that symbol again. So oh, I have. Because, uh, I yeah, think it has I some have, importance. If you want to uh, email uh, my, go on my, my website, Jordan Maxwell's show. And 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 uh, and ask for that symbol, and I'll tell the people who are manning my site to look for your email and put a cult symbol in the in the title, um, and then I'll I'll send it to you. I've got it, boy. I don't. I would never forget that symbol. So I've made copies of it on all my hard drives. So yeah, I've got it. I'll send it to you. I wouldn't be surprised to see what you might have to say about it. Well, that's great, Jordan, and uh, I just want to thank you again, and keep up the good work. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Do email me. I'll get back to you. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much for the call, Jay. Let's hear from Don in South Carolina. Don, you're live on What on Earth is Happening with my special guest, Jordan Maxwell. Welcome. I see John. Uh, Hello, Mark. How are you doing? It's John, by the way. John, I'm sorry. It's okay. Doing well. Jordan, how are you doing? Well, comparatively well, I think. 
I uh, I just wanted you to know uh, I'm about I'm 65 years old, and if you can, this is one person that you can say that you're responsible for changing his life. Because I kind of grew up with a lot of this stuff when I was coming up. I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness, and mm-hmm. I learned at an early age how wrong that was. So I got very interested in investigating things, especially in the, the biblical sense, because the entire Western world's attitude is based on their interpretation of the Bible. Mm-hmm. So I spent my early years doing a lot of that. And then after my first divorce, I was in a hotel room. And watching TV, this was before a whole lot of things started on the Internet. And uh, watching TV, and on a one of these oddball stations, it had Jordan Maxwell. I'd never seen Jordan before. Mm-hmm. And it was showing some Illuminati stuff, and Jordan gave, gave a speech. I can't remember what it was. But I thought about that for a couple of years, and when I found Jordan on the Internet, I probably spent a month sitting in there watching every video that he did, every video I could find. And I just, you know, he really made a a big, big difference in my life. And I just wanted him to know that. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I just, I just do what I do. And hopefully, you know, whoever's supposed to hear me will and whoever's not supposed to hear me won't. So I appreciate it, though. Don't get many good comments. I have a I have a question for for you, Jordan, if I may, and also yeah. one for uh, Mark too. Uh, you were talking earlier about the Hebrews being, you know, their henotheistic. Uh, uh, is that correct? Henotheistic. Mm-hmm. Yes. What about the the Zionist sect? Is that do they not, uh, or at least put out the uh, idea that they're monotheistic? The well, Zionist. Yeah, well, Zionism is not Jewish. It has zero, nothing to, but to do with being Hebrew or Jewish. It's a, it's a very, very hidden, well-hidden uh, political uh, society. It's a very profoundly dark and, and, uh, and well-hidden um, operation. And it has nothing to do with being Jewish at all. Zionism has zero to do with being Jewish and Israeli, period. Uh, and the reason why, uh, some of the things you need to know about the Zionists is that when <clears throat> the original Zionists, uh, Chi and Wiseman and, uh, and uh, Herzl, Herzl, Chi and Wiseman, the people who were founding Zionism, uh, who they really were, what they were connected to, the secret societies that they were connected to, but uh, when the Zionists were looking to form a, uh, their own homeland, their own base of operations, political base of operations, the first place they picked was Uganda, Africa. That's a fact in the, of history. They picked Uganda. But the British, uh, after looking at it, decided that doesn't sound like it's going to work. So uh, they abandoned, the Zionists abandoned Uganda as their, as their homeland for the Jews. And then they went, to, they went to other, they went to four other places on the earth. Uh, they even talked about, they even uh, had discussions with the president at the time about the president of the U.S. about uh, uh, having a homeland in Texas. But the, tech, but the Texas state and the, and the federal government decided that's not going to be uh, very smart having a Zionist homeland in Texas. So they abandoned that one. Well, there's about three or four more other places that they tried to set up their homeland. And finally, finally, they decided, well, let's go to the Middle East because nobody knows it's there. And so they went to the Middle East. Well, you need to understand that if, if it was really based on the Bible and the biblical idea of God's chosen people, they would have went to Israel to start with. They wouldn't have gone to Uganda and Texas and all the other places. It's in the history books. Look at all the different places that Zionism wanted to set up a homeland that didn't work. Jordan, hold that thought right there. We're coming up to another break. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back after these words. You're listening to What on Earth is Happening. Stay with us. 
back, everyone. This is What on Earth is Happening. I'm your host, Mark Passio. My special guest this evening, Jordan Maxwell. We were taking a call from John from South Carolina, and he had asked Jordan uh, about Zionism. And Jordan, you were talking about uh, you know the orders uh, within Zionism had been debating among themselves about uh, setting up a base, a political base of operations. I'll let you pick it up from that point. Yeah, well, like I said, it has nothing to do with God. God gave this land to the Jewish people, and, and uh, you know, this is a, uh, a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Uh, it's a bunch of bull. You go back to you go back to the beginning of Zionism, and you read what Baron von Hurst and she and Wiseman and the other Zionists what what they were really talking about. If you go back and read it, and find out where the money came from, always trace the money. Oh, the cops will tell you that. The detectives will tell you that. Always trace the money. Where did the money come from? And so when you trace the money behind Zionism and trace the secret society that gave the money to the Zionists, and then when you see that the Zionists wanted to establish their first homeland uh, in, like I said, Africa, Uganda, and that didn't work, and then they were going to put it in Texas. That didn't work. Well, they're going to put it 